<laughs> sir, now is it audible? Yes. Okay. Uh, good evening, friends. And as usual, I am seeing the people are waiting on the YouTube as well as on the Zoom. We have the insightful session by Mr. S. R. Somashekhar, a former district judge from Bangalore. He has taken a lot of sessions on Evidence Act have been insightful. And as and when we have been requesting him, he has been acceding to our request. He not only beyond law, but all those who watch him are fascinated the way he sees, takes the topic. And one of his sessions is about, in fact, to touch 80,000 views. It only shows the volume, the way in which he speaks. Today's topic is exclusion of oral by documentary evidence. The reference in this regard would be to primarily on section 91 to 100 of the Evidence Act. Since there was some delay, we will not take much time and straight away we will request sir uh, to take over the knowledgeable session. Over sir. Uh, good evening friends. <clears throat> the subject for discussion today is exclusion of oral evidence by documentary evidence. You are able to hear me? Yes, you are able to hear me? Okay. The relevant provisions are sections 91 to 100. Before it's audible, it's audible, perfect. Perfect, okay. Yeah. Before taking you through the provisions of sections 91 to 100, we need to refer to certain other provisions of the Evidence Act. That is section 59 and 60. And then 61. Foundation is required. Chapter 4, Oral Evidence, Section 59. All facts except the contents of documents or electronic records may be proved by oral evidence. So, Section 59 itself will indicate to us what the scope of sections 91, 92 and the following sections are. Therefore, section 59 makes it clear that if there is a document, there is no question of oral evidence. So what extent oral evidence is prohibited? How it really functions in a court of law? They are all matters of detail about which I will tell. The basic rule as per section 59 is, if there is a document, the contents of the document cannot be proved by oral evidence. Then section 60, oral evidence must be direct, that is rule of hearsay is prohibited. I am not on that. Then 61, primary evidence, secondary evidence and all that. Now, how does this work in courts? That's important for us. It has been a common practice in civil cases, or particularly in civil cases, during the course of cross-examination of the plaintiff or the defendant, to ask him a question. You have stated something in the chief examination as to your title. You have stated something in the chief examination as to the title of your vendor. Let us say the plaintiff claims title under a sale deed executed by one X. The defendant disputes the title of X himself. He says, at the point of time when X executed a sale deed in favor of the plaintiff, X himself was not the owner. Even if he has executed a sale deed in favor of the plaintiff, the question of the plaintiff becoming owner does not arise. That takes us to Section 8 of the Transfer of Property Act, which says, he who does not possess anything cannot part with it. 
Now, during the course of cross examination, the plaintiff is asked a question. You claim title under a sale deed executed by X. Did you verify how X became the owner? He says, I verified. What did you verify? I went through the encumbrance register, I uh, obtained the sub sale deed, I said to went through the sale deed, some partition deed, some will, gift, whatever it is. I was convinced and satisfied that X was the owner. Do you have the document which, which shows that X was the owner of the property when he sold it to you? He says it is X. The next common question which is put is, do you have any impediment to produce? Well, he may say, normally he says, I have no impediment to produce. The cross examiner should stop there. Should stop there, not to stop with the evidence. He has to further proceed. He can't request the court, let him produce that, thereafter I will cross examine. Neither the court should defer the cross examination only to enable the plaintiff or the defendant to produce the document. The title of X who sold the property to the plaintiff has been disputed by the defendant. Plaintiff says he has with him a document which discloses that X had title to the property when he sold it to him. He also says that he has no obstacle or impediment or difficulty in producing it. Having elicited this answer, a prudent lawyer appearing for the defendant or a prudent lawyer who cross examines the plaintiff or the defendant should stop there. Stop there means, as I said, not, uh, uh, going, to, uh, not going on with the cross examination. He has to go to other aspects. There is no question of deferring cross examination to enable him to produce. If he does not produce, then under 114 of the evidence that it is open to the court to draw an adverse inference. Well, 114 has got number of illustrations and one of them says, if some evidence which is available in the plaintiff or the defendant is not produced, when material evidence, not all irrelevant evidence, if some material evidence is not produced, then the court can draw an inference against the plaintiff or the defendant and say, if produced, that would have gone against the plaintiff or the defendant and therefore he has not deliberately produced it. This is one aspect of the matter which uh, lawyers need to know, which judicial officers need to know. The next question that is asked is, all right, you say that you have that document, you have gone through that document. What is that document? The title deed of X, the vendor of the plaintiff. It could be a sale deed, partition deed, release, give, will, some grant or whatever it is. Experience has shown what does that document contain? You say that X got the property from Y. Is it recited in the document that Y was the owner? You say that X got the partition, uh, property at a partition. Is it stated in the document that at a partition the property fell to his share? This is what is prohibited by section 59 and 91 to which I will come later. The contents of a document cannot be the subject matter of oral evidence. This is something which lawyers who practice in the courts need to know it. Lawyers who intend to become judicial officers and judicial officers who have already started functioning should know it. There is no question of permitting the cross examiner to ask the witness of the party what does the document contain. It is prohibited. It will be the contents of a document. It will be the contents of a document. This is the foundation. With this, let us go to section 91 to 100. We will start with 91 and then go to 92. There is some impression that sections 91 and 92 are a little complicated. If we carefully read it, we will see there is no complication at all. We have to carefully read it, understand it, analyze it, then it will be as simple as any other provision is. 
There is only one difficulty with some of these enactments. Most of these pre-constitutional enactments, particularly on the civil side, the Evidence Act of 1872, the Contract Act, the Transfer of Property Act, these having been drafted by Englishmen and which suited the conditions prevailing in England having been borrowed wholesale for the Indian situation, the language is a little tough. Unless lawyers and judicial officers have a fairly good command over the language, it will be difficult. Or there is a effective, true and correct translation of those uh, enactments into the local language, it would be difficult. Therefore, uh, my advice to young lawyers is, well, whatever be your local language, whatever be your regional language, whatever be the language in which you argue in the court, draft your pleadings. You need to have a minimum command over the English language, try to improve your vocabulary. Then only you will be able to understand some provisions of some of these enactments, as I said, the Contract Act, the Evidence Act, the Transfer of Property Act, maybe some provisions of the Indian Penal Code also. This is aside the subject, but just take it as a piece of advice or suggestion. Don't go by the marginal note given to any provision. The marginal note is supposed to be only an indicator. Many times it does not clearly indicate what the provision contains. So therefore, let us read the provisions themselves and find out what it conveys. I am reading 91. When the terms of a contract are of a grant, or of any other disposition of property have been reduced to the form of a document and in all cases in which any matter is required by law to be reduced to the form of a document, no evidence shall be given in proof of the terms of said contract, grant or other disposition of property or of such matter except the document itself or secondary evidence of its contents in cases in which Secondary evidence is admissible under the provisions hearing before contained. There are two things here. When does section 91 apply? When the terms of a contract or of a grant or of any other disposition of property have been reduced to the form of a document and in all cases in which any matter is required by law to be reduced to the form of a document. All contracts need not be in writing. I have been telling any number of times on this platform and elsewhere also that an agreement of sale does not require writing. There could be even an oral agreement of sale. If a person wants to claim the benefit of Section 53A of the Transfer of Property Act, not able to hear. You are able to hear. If he wants to take the benefit of Section 53, it must be a written instrument and registered. Otherwise, there is no need for an agreement of sale to be even in writing. Supposing parties have chosen to reduce it into writing. Parties have chosen to reduce it into writing. Law doesn't require it to be in writing. Parties have chosen it to be in writing in such an event Section 91 bars oral evidence. The next situation is, and in all cases in which <coughs> any matter is required by law to be reduced in the form of a document, there are certain transactions, there are certain contracts which necessarily need to be in writing, which necessarily need to be in writing. In such an event, oral evidence is clearly impermissible. So I repeat. When law, though law does not require a contract or a transaction to be reduced to the form of a document, but if the parties choose to put it in writing, then that writing alone needs to be produced. Oral evidence is excluded, prohibited, preclaimed, precluded. And when law requires it to be in writing. I think there's some uh, uh, sound from your back. Some people are there. Probably someone has to close the door. Here, 
a uh, lot of songs from your uh, backdrop. Uh, for someone else, okay. Yeah. At your place. Why? Maybe that door has to be closed so that it's uh, it becomes audible. Well, normally, I would have opened. There was no problem all these days. What's the problem today? Sir, uh, there's a lot of sound coming. Probably your neighbors are talking, etc. Okay. 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 Now, yes. Do you still have the disturbance now? So I will I'll let you know if it comes. Okay, I'll start. So, therefore, when the law requires to be in writing, there is no question, well, I have purchased a sale, I have purchased a property, have, it is worth more than rupees 100. It is an oral sale, law doesn't recognize it. Then, there are some exceptions and all that, we will come to that. And then what it says, in such an event, that contract, grant or disposition will have to be proved by producing that very document. Supposing that original document is not available, section 65 of the evidence act says that a foundation is to be laid for letting in secondary evidence. I have on this platform on number of occasions believed that I have laid foundation with regard to section 65 of the evidence act as to when secondary evidence could be let in. I have also made it clear that there is no need to make an application for letting in secondary evidence, that foundation has to be laid by entering the witness box. This we have made it clear. Now there are some exceptions to this. Exception one, when a public officer is required by law to be appointed in writing, and when it is shown that any particular person has acted as such officer, the writing by which he is appointed need not be proved. A revenue officer passes number of orders. He transfers khata. He affects mutation. A judicial officer records deposition. A judicial officer passes orders and judgments. A police officer does something. Now, some person doubts that he is really a public officer. No, you are not a tahsildar at all. You are not the deputy commissioner. You are not the collector. When a public officer is required by law to be appointed in writing, I am sure that uh, there is no question of oral appointment except appointing some maid servants in the house. There is no question of uh, giving an oral appointment. A oral appointment is only to you come to my house, I uh, am free by 6 p.m. That's all the oral appointment. If it is a question of a job, obviously it would be in writing. And when it is shown, when a public officer is required by law to be appointed in writing, and when it is shown that any particular person has acted as such officer, the writing by which he is appointed, he has to do. there is no need to produce that writing. The fact that he is a public officer and uh, which requires his appointment to be in writing. And when it is shown, well, he has been recording evidence, he has been conducting cases, Tashila visiting several villages, that itself is sufficient. Exception two bills admitted to probate in India may be proved by the probate. Now, the Indian Succession Act gives the meaning of what a probate is. Section 2, subsection F. Probate means the copy of a will certified under the seal of a court of competent jurisdiction with a grant of administration to the estate of the testator. So the original will is produced to the court which grants the probate. It's a different matter that the petitioner who files a petition for probate should be an executor appointed by the testator. Who an executor is also defined in this act. I am not dealing with those things in detail. Now, will, as all of you know, requires to be attested by two witnesses. Section 68 of the evidence act says whether will is admitted or denied. Uh, to prove a will, at least one attesting witness needs to be examined. Thereafter only the will is said to be proved. Now in a probate proceeding, the question of examining the title of the testator will not arise, whether this is the last will of the testator, whether it has been duly attested and executed is all that is seen in the probate court. When once that probate is given, what is its consequence? Read such explanation to Explanation to wills admitted to probate in India may be proved by the probate. 
therefore there is no need to produce the will that probate itself is proof of the execution of the will how does this operate i told you that by granting probate the court did not concern itself rather should not concern itself about the title of the testator what all the court needs to examine is whether it is the last will of the testator whether it has been attested by two witnesses as required by section 63 of the indian succession act whether it is proved by examining at least one attesting witness in the manner contemplated by section 68 of the evidence act if the court is satisfied about these two or three basic requirements it will issue a probate probate does not establish the title of the testator now a probate is obtained it is proof of the execution of the will in some other suit for declaration of title or partition the opponent or the party himself claims title under a will in that separate in that suit for partition declaration or whatever it be he need not again prove the will he need not even produce the will this probate itself is sufficient there that court will examine no doubt no, probate is there probate is issued by the court but that does not mean that the court has examined the title of the testator one of you may execute a will in favor of someone else in respect of the house where i am staying two witnesses will attest it somebody is appointed as an executor he files a petition the court is satisfied that it is the uh, will of so and so and uh then it is duly attested probate is issued do i lose or do i lose title to this flat impossible what you are not required to prove is prove the will again that probate is sufficient then explanation exceptions 1 and 2 explanation 1 this section applies equally to cases in which the contracts grants or dispositions of property referred to are contained in one document and to cases in which they are contained in more documents than one well there will be some more documents uh, one executed by a in favor of b b in favor of a some several transactions at the same time two or more documents would have been executed that situations are there then explanation two where there are more originals than one 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 original only need be proved explanation three this statement in any document whatever of a fact other than the facts referred to in this section shall not preclude the admission of oral evidence the statement in any document whatever of a fact other than the facts referred to in this section shall not preclude the admission of oral evidence as to the same fact this is extremely important my request to the beginner says not to go by the illustrations given in any enactment more particularly the evidence act of course uh, as far as the illustrations given to section 91 they relate to a civil case hardly there will be cases where the court is required to examine some letters bill of exchange and all that don't go by the illustrations given there i will tell you from my experience in what situations this would arise this statement in any document whatever of a fact other than the facts referred to in this section shall not preclude the admission of oral evidence as to the same fact we will take an example there is some written there is some document in the preamble of that document this say uh, this document or this instrument executed on such and such a day by mr x son of y residing at a particular place in favor of mr a son of b did you follow this document executed by x son of y age about so many years residing at a particular place is executed in favor of a son of b this is only a preamble this does not form part of the main contents of the document now there is some dispute 
let us say that x who has executed the document is the son of one z but not y by some mistake the name of y has come there this happens uh, well there is some uh, uh, let us say rama murti ramesh some people say there is some rama instead of mentioning it as the document writer or the advocate who drafts it he has it as ramesh instead of ram murti or narasimha murti or krishna murti something of that kind it happens now more evidence can be given now the other side says well you have purchased the property you are that uh, that uh, the ex son of ram murti you are the ex son of krishna murti well true i am certainly son of krishna murti only but by mistake the name of my father is mentioned as ram murti section 91 does not prohibit it it is open to him because other than the what does it say the statement in any document whatever of a fact other than the facts referred to in this section shall not preclude the admission of oral evidence as to the same fact then let us see 92 <clears throat> when the terms of any such contract grant or other disposition of property or any matter required by law to be reduced to the form of a document have been proved according to the last section how they are proved they are produced by their actual production and in the manner stated by sections 67 to 72 of the evidence act they are produced and they are proved when the document has been proved in the manner stated in the evidence act then what is the next clause no evidence of any oral agreement or statement shall be admitted as between the parties to any such instrument or the representatives in interest for the purpose of contradicting very adding to or subtracting from its terms this is strictly what is known as exclusion of oral by documentary evidence so 91 it prohibits oral evidence in respect of certain transactions which have been reduced to the form of a document or which law requires to be in writing what 92 says is when there is such a document don't give oral evidence to in contradiction or variation of the terms of the document this is very easy to say but how does it work in practice well as on today if not more at least 70 to 75% of the litigation in the civil courts pertains to rural india most of these documents transactions in respect of agriculture land small sites and all that even to this day with so much of education awareness and everything there will be some person in the village who will be in a dominant position does not tell anything to the other person takes his signature takes his thumb mark and obtains a document in what situation that oral evidence can be given is the question that is covered by now this is invariably what happens in many of the cases at least in the state of karnataka the popular defense for the last 20 to 25 years in suits for specific performance is no doubt the defendant has executed the agreement of sale but he never intended to exist sell the property plaintiff never intended to buy the property defendant wanted a loan from the plaintiff plaintiff said you execute a document in the nature of an agreement of sale agreed to sell your property then i will lend money i was forced to borrow some money as in financially strained circumstances therefore i acceded to the request to the plaintiff and executed a document in the nature of an agreement of sale which was intended to be only a security for the loan borrowed by me and neither i intended to sell the property nor the plaintiff intended to sell the property 
But if you simply go by the main part of section 92, it would give you an indication. Well, the document reads like an agreement of sale. It has been proved. Where is the question of the defendant being permitted to show that the transaction covered by it is really not an agreement of sale, it is not a sale transaction at all, or it is a loan transaction. Experienced lawyers and those who are practicing in courts on the civil side and judicial officers would have known by now that in many cases, the plaintiff files a suit saying, true, there is a sale deed said to have been executed by me in favor of the defendant. It was never intended to convey any title to the defendant. It is a sham document. It is a nominal document. For some purpose, that document was executed. The intention was not that I should part with the property. Defendant's intention was not to purchase the property and become the owner. Equally, the defendant may say, plaintiffs use him for title on the basis of a registered sale deed. Defendant takes a contention true. The document produced by the plaintiff reads like a sale deed. But there is no sale transaction at all. I wanted loan. Plaintiff said no mortgage deed. I wanted a sale deed. I want a sale deed. It is in those circumstances the document has come into being. Of course, I have decisions of the Supreme Court. I will cite it at the end. These have been recognized by courts. What the Supreme Court ultimately has said is, Section 92 does not bar a party to show that the intended transaction is not reflected in the document. The document, reflect, the transaction reflected in the document or the transaction shown in the document or mentioned in the document was not the real transaction which we had, it was something else that is not prohibited by Section 92. If such an interpretation is not placed in a country like this, where people are poor, where they are illiterate, rustic and other things, well, it would have been extremely difficult for them to establish a right, right to their property. Therefore, courts have recognized it. There are a good number of exceptions in the form of provisos to section 92 and 93 to 100 also make sometimes, sometimes a funny reading, sometimes an interesting reading and all that. So let us be very clear about this position. Let us make this subtle distinction. We should be very clear about this distinction. What is prohibited by 92 is if the document is already proved and if both the parties admit the nature of the document, well, they can't give oral evidence contrary to it. But if the intended transaction is not reflected in the document, it is still open to the parties to show that the document has been given that name, but we intended something else that is not prohibited by this. Then, I don't find uh, many seniors here, maybe there are a few. In the state of Karnataka, long back in 60s, we had an act called the Mysore Agriculturist Debtors Relief Act. The Mysore Agriculturist Debtors Relief Act. It is an enactment of 59 or 60 or something. Now, rich people used to lend money to poor farmers and poor riots and uh, Agriculturists obtain sale deed from them as a security for the loan borrowed. Then the Karnataka legislature thought it would be a great injustice to those people. They made that enactment saying it would be open to the person who has executed that sale deed to show before the jurisdiction was then with the assistant commissioner, the subdivisional magistrate to show that it was not a sale transaction, it was a loan transaction. Of course, that act is repeated. And uh, there are a good number of decisions of the Mysore of the then Mysore High Court in this regard. So what I am trying now, I am because uh, I am not speaking to advocates or judicial officers only from Karnataka, throughout the country. Therefore, I don't cite any decision of the Karnataka High Court. I will take you through some decisions of the Supreme Court at the end. 
So let us be clear about this position. I am repeating it. 92 does not prohibit a party from showing that the transaction described in the document or reflected in the document or recited in the document or mentioned in the document he is not the one which we had. It was something else. In these circumstances, we drafted, we gave the, this document came into being. Whether the plaintiff or the defendant is successful in establishing that plea is a different thing. That is a matter for evidence. How well, what kind of evidence he gives, how he fares in the cross-examination, how the court appreciates the evidence, how the lawyers present the case, they are all matters in a given case about which we can't say anything. But law does not prohibit a party from showing that the transaction mentioned in the document is not the one mentioned therein, but it was something else. Our intention was totally different. Now let us see the provisos. Proviso 1. Any fact may be proved which would, indeed, which would invalidate any document or which would entitle any person to any decree or order relating thereto, such as fraud, intimidation, illegality, want of due execution, want of capacity in any contracting party, want or failure of consideration, or mistake in fact or law. Now, those who are familiar with the provisions of the contract, obviously everybody is familiar because uh, it's a core subject in law. The certain pleas are available to the parties to show that the document is vitiated by some of these vices, coercion, undue influence, fraud, misrepresentation, mistake, and mistake. This proviso one says, well, this document has come into be true. It is an account of some fraud played by the other side. Intimidation. If there is a threat to me, it is illegal. The document is totally illegal. Then it has not been properly executed. The parties were incompetent to enter into the transaction because some of them was minor or some of them was a lunatic. Failure of consideration. 23 of the contract that says, part of consideration vitiates it. All these things are mistake in fact are law. So you will have to familiarize yourself with the provisions of section 13 to 20 of the Indian Contract Act. Proviso 2. The existence of any separate oral agreement as to any matter on which a document is silent and which is not inconsistent with its terms may be proved. In considering whether or not this proviso applies, the court should have regard to the degree of formality of the document. Therefore, apart from a document, they there may be a contemporaneous oral agreement also. Tell it is executed. Then there may be a contemporaneous oral agreement saying, well, after I pay back this money to execute and then we read and the property. Something of this type. The existence of any separate oral agreement as to any matter on which a document is silent and which is not inconsistent with its terms may be proved. Then proviso 3, the existence of any separate oral agreement constituting a condition precedent to the attaching of any obligation under any such contract, grant or disposition of property may be proved. It's a little complicated to understand. I'll try to make it simple. The existence of any separate oral agreement constituting a condition precedent to the attaching of any obligation under any such contract. Uh, well, the document shows the sale consideration as something. There is a separate oral agreement saying, well, apart from what is mentioned therein, unless you pay something else, there will be no completed transaction. So there could be some kind of an oral agreement also that can all, and that will be a condition precedent. Unless you do it, this document will not come into effect. This transaction will not go through. Instances are there, but uh, law has provided for this. What I want all the participants to appreciate is this. This Evidence Act is of the 19th century, obviously drafted by English people. They also knew the conditions in England, uh, in India. Even in those days, the framers are so much of common sense that they could anticipate several such things. You may also notice 
certain additions have been made to the evidence that from 45A, 45B, 65B, presumption regarding dowry, death, suicide and all that. The substratum of the evidence that has remained unamended even to this day, from 1872, I think a little less than 200 years, it has stood the test of time. So is the case with the contract act. So is it the case with the transfer of property act. So is the case with the Indian Penal Code. The more offences are found and they, are, they find a place there. So therefore, people who drafted these legislations had a lot of common sense. They knew what the world was, what kind of transactions were going on, what would happen. Therefore, to the extent possible, they provided for all contingencies. They can't expect uh, everything to happen to the best of their wisdom, to the best of their experience, anticipating certain future problems and litigations, they would have provided. It is the courts which will have to supply some kind of an omission by a process of interpretation if it is permissible. Then proviso 4, the existence of any distinct subsequent oral agreement to rescind or modify any such contract, grant or disposition of property may be proved, except in case in which the contract, grant or disposition of property is by law required to be in writing. So even that uh, subsequent uh, oral, subsequent contract, if that is also required to be in writing, there is no question of a subsequent oral agreement being brought on record or has been registered according to the law in force for the timing as to the registration of document. Proviso 5. Any usage or custom by which incidents not expressly mentioned in any contract are usually annexed to contracts of the description may be proved. Now, if you read some decisions under section 34 of the Civil Procedure Code dealing with the powers of the court to grant interest, three periods are covered, interest up to the date of suit, from the date of suit till the date of decree, it is called pendent allied interest, then further interest from the date of decree to the date of payment. Decisions say interest for a period up to the date of suit. The basis for that is either the contract between the parties or some statute should provide for it or there may be a mercantile usage or custom. Now, it is open to the parties to show any usage or custom by which incidents not expressly mentioned in any contract are usually annexed to contracts of that description may be proved. Uh, now, a wholesaler sells some goods to a retailer. There's a credit bill. If in the credit bill there is no mention that for delayed payment some interest has to be paid, it is open to the plaintiff creditor who sues him to show that there is a mercantile usage or custom which entitles me to interest at a particular rate when there is a delayed payment. So, proviso 5 says, well, even though that bill or document or whatever it is, does not mention that the plaintiff is entitled to interest, whether the plaintiff succeeds in proving that the existence of such custom is a different aspect. But law enables him to place on record the existence of such a custom, whether that custom is recognized, whether that custom satisfies the ingredients of all that is required of a custom is a different aspect of the matter. But Law certainly enables the party to place evidence regarding the existence of such custom. Then, provided that the arranging of such incident would not be repugnant to or inconsistent with the express terms of the grant. Supposing if the, if the custom is totally against the main document, <coughs> then that cannot be proved. Proviso 6, any fact may be proved which shows in what manner the language of a document is related to existing facts. <coughs> you see, I said that you may avoid this reading of these illustrations, but one illustration may be, to go to illustration C, an estate called the Rampure T estate is sold by a deed which contains a map of the property sold. The fact that the land not included in the map had always been regarded as part of the estate and was meant to pass by the deed cannot be proved. Uh, some uh, real stations are given. <coughs> Any fact may be proved which shows in what manner the language of a document is related to existing facts. There will be some ambiguity there. This is what we have meant. 
This is what we have meant. In each state, in each district, certain expressions carry a particular kind of meaning. A particular kind of meaning. Now in Karnataka itself, certain expressions are used <coughs> from people from Mangalore, Urupi and other things. They give a particular meaning. People from Hubli and Dharwad attach a particular meaning. People from Old Mysore region, there are certain common words. So it is possible to explain. It is in this sense we have said so. Then 93. Now uh, in the law examinations those days, there used to be a popular question. Latent ambiguity and patent ambiguity. Are seen the document itself, some ambiguity is seen. That is called a patent ambiguity. <coughs> Latent is some evidence is required to discover that ambiguity. So, this 93 to 99, they speak of these latent ambiguities and patent ambiguities. Which of those provisions speaks of patent ambiguity? Which of those provisions speaks of latent ambiguity? Provisions themselves are either patent or latent. That is a little difficult task. Don't go by each of those individual sections. I will just give a, make a tertiary reading to each of them. I will take some two or three illustrations and then try to explain to you <coughs> the substance of this 93 to 99. When the language used in a document is on its face, ambiguous or defective, Evidence may not be given of the facts which would show its meaning or supply its defects. Illustration. A agrees in writing to sell a horse to B for rupees 1000 or 1500. Evidence cannot be given to show which price was to be given. It is a patent ambiguity. So instead of horse, you read it as house. Nobody sells horse these days. And now, house. A enters into an agreement of sale with B saying that I will sell this house for 10 lakhs or 15 lakhs. There is no question of oral evidence being given to say, well, he agreed to sell it as 10 lakhs by the defendant. Plaintiff cannot say, I agreed to sell it for 15 lakhs. This is a patent ambiguity. There is no question of oral evidence being given because it says he is on its face ambiguous or defective. Then, a deed contains blanks. Evidence cannot be given of facts which would show how they were meant to be filled. The document is blank. This was the part. We wanted this to be a sales deed. We wanted this to be a margin deed. Such an evidence cannot be given. 95. Evidence as to document unmeaning in reference to existing facts. When the language used in a document is plain in itself, but is unmeaning in reference to the existing facts, the evidence may be given to show that it was used in a peculiar sense. Uh, this illustration is good. A sells to be by deed my house in Calcutta. He mentions in the document, I have a house belonging to me in Calcutta, I am selling. A had no house in Calcutta, but it appears that he had a house at Howrah of which B had been in possession since the execution of a deed, these facts may be proved to show that the deed related to the house at Howrah. Uh, well, this is a good illustration. I will try to explain this. Now, in certain places, there are some extensions named after some individuals, named after some the name of a god or whatever it is. I presently am in Bangalore of Karnataka. I have some fair acquaintance with Mysore. There is an extension, a very popular extension in Bangalore city called Jainagar. In Mysore also, there is an extension called Jainagar. Now, somebody has a property in Jainagar, Mysore. He has a property in Jainagar, Mysore. He executes a sale deed in favor of the property at Mysore, Jainagar, in favor of someone else. Since he is a man in Bangalore, the document writer or the advocate who drafts it by some mistake 
while describing the property in the scheduled the document instead of saying property bearing number so and so bounded on the east west etc situated in jainagar mysore he mentioned it as jainagar bangalore so what he sold was the property situated in jainagar mysore but by some mistake instead of mentioning it as jainagar mysore it is shown as jainagar bangalore that person in whose favor the sale deed is executed as him well you have sold a property to be in mysore this is the sale deed uh, well you have not given my not handed over possession to me please hand well i have not sold any property to you in mysore see the sale deed you see that is jainagar bangalore i have not sold any property to you in jainagar mysore where is the question of my handing over possession then this person can lead oral evidence to show that this man does not own any property in jainagar bangalore at all even if he owns a property in jainagar bangalore he would not have sold this for this consideration obviously the value of the house or property in jainagar bangalore is far above the value of a property of a similar dimension in jainagar mysore you don't own any property at all the house where you are staying in jainagar bangalore is a rented house assuming that it is your own house you would not have sold the property for a lesser sum therefore what was intended to be sold by you was a property owned by you in jainagar mysore not the property otherwise what would happen by some mistake some errors would creep in if 92 is strictly read no no oral evidence contrary to the terms of the written document where will the litigants go therefore apart from the provisos 1 to 6 to section 92 which are exceptions we have other exceptions covered by 93 to 99 <coughs> i have read a few of them 93 and 94 i have read 95 also i have read then 96 uh 90 ah uh, one more i forgot we will see 94 when language used in a document is plain in itself and when it applies accurately to existing facts evidence may not be given to show that it was meant to meant to apply to such facts so then there is no ambiguity at all everything is clear no no we did not mean like this that is prohibited uh, 94 i had skipped all right now we shall come to 96 when the facts are such that the language used might have been meant to apply to anyone and could not have been meant to apply to more than one of several persons or things evidence may be given of facts which show which of those persons or things it was intended to apply to illustrations a agrees to sell to me for rupees 1000 my white horse a has two white horses evidence may be given of facts to show which of them was meant as i said let us read this horse as house a agrees to sell to b some house in a particular place for 10 lakhs he has named those houses uh paper some uh, in the name of this family deity or some person in whose favor he has his, his wife son or something he has named them There are two portions. For both the portions, she has put the same name. There are two tenements or something of the kind. He says, "My house, Lakshmi Nivas, Ganapati Nivas, or something." I am selling. But he has two properties. Somebody would have told, "Why, whichever house you purchase, you put the name of Ganesha, you put the name of Ganesha, or something of that." Right? For some reason, he has put it. There is no compulsion that he should not. Uh, Uh, there is no violation of any trade bar or anything of that type because both the houses belong to him now he has agreed to sell one of those houses now there are two houses which is that house here which he has agreed to sell or which he has already sold then oral evidence can be given as you have those two houses you have named both the houses they are given the same names to both the houses what you sold to me or what you agreed to sell to me was the house on the eastern side or the western side which was on this road which was in this extension and not in the other extension then yeah, there is one more illustration a agrees to accompany b to hyderabad 
evidence may be given a fact showing whether hyderabad in the deccan or hyderabad in silt was better well uh, those were times when such uh, things prevailed and therefore illustrations are given then 97 when the language used applies partly to one set of existing facts and partly to another set of existing facts but the whole of it does not apply correctly to either the evidence may be given to show to which of the two it was meant to apply a agrees to sell b my land at x in the occupation of y a has a land at x but not in the occupation of y see one part is true what he has agreed he has agreed to sell a land at x and in the document he says it is in the occupation of y certainly has a land at x but it was not in the occupation of y but it was in the occupation of someone else so evidence may be given of facts showing which he meant to sell did he meant to sell the land in the or the house in the occupation of y or z 98 evidence may be given to show the meaning of illegible or not commonly intelligible characters of foreign absolute absolute means or not old not in existence technical local and provincial expressions of abbreviations and of words used in a peculiar sense as i said each region uses certain expressions certain things are common but certain names are given for certain transactions for certain like kinds of plants and all that a person from this year region may not be knowing the fits me therefore what actually it is meant evidence may be given to show the meaning of illegible they are writing also something is illegible so this is what is written whether it is true or not that's a different thing uh, some illustration is given then uh, 98 this is important persons who are not parties to a document or their representatives in interest may give evidence of any facts tending to show a contemporaneous agreement very in the terms of the document persons who are not parties to a document or the representatives in interest may give evidence of any facts tending to show a contemporaneous agreement very in the terms of the document well a executes a agreement of sale in favor of b now it is open to c to show that there is another agreement executed by a in my favor you can't say that there is already a written document executed by a i don't permit you to lead oral evidence because he is not a party to the document now how does this practically work this is what i have told this is a rule of evidence which the court will take into consideration at the time of writing judgment and appreciating the evidence this exclusion Uh, please know see if we just read these provisions without going to the court we get some impression all right in the plaint it is stated that it is a sale deed what is produced is a sale deed he wants to show defendant wants to show that it is a mortgage deed no 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 92 says oral evidence is excluded a man who has not come to the court who has only read books what he would say no 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 when once that a defendant uh, comes to the court the judge will tell him no you are excluded from proving that it is a mortgage no you go away no that's not how it happens now that evidence would come whether the case of the defendant is covered by any of the exceptions referred to in section 92 whether it is open to him to bring the case under any of those subsections sections 93 to 99 all that is a matter for appreciation of evidence there is no question of the judge telling no no you have produced this document uh, this, this document it has already been proved in the manner stated by 68 to 72 i don't permit you to say that it is a market deed that doesn't happen at all nowadays after cpc is amended that situation does not arise because everything stated in the plaint or in the written statement finds a place in evidence so all these things are ultimately to be taken into consideration by the lions while arguing the, the matters no this is the stand is there any exception as i made out a case of exception is it covered by any of the provisions to 92 is it covered by 93 to 99 otherwise whatever oral evidence is given is totally inadmissible sometime back 
when I had spoken on this platform about the admissibility of unstamped, insufficiently stamped and unregistered documents, and also about trial of partition suits, I had brought to the notice of the audience a decision of the Supreme Court in AR 1968, Supreme Court, page 1297 or something. It's a very peculiar case. Now, the, please understand the legal position. Please be very clear about this. Two files, two files here. Dark, like my court. There is okay, this side, this side, yes, those two. Yes. This is AR 1968 Supreme Court 1299. AR 1968 Supreme Court 1299. Shiro versus Hem Kumar. Shiro versus Hem Kumar. I have exhausted myself in telling on this platform and on a number of other platforms that barring a few stray decisions here and there, which were rendered taking into consideration some circumstances, equitable considerations and all that. The consistent view taken by the Supreme Court is certainly under the Hindu law, oral partition is permitted. But when once that partition is put in writing, if that if under that very document a division has taken place or a partition has taken place, that requires registration. But if it is a record of a prior partition or a memorandum of an earlier partition, saying the partition took place a month back, two years back, there was no writing. Today we are reducing it to writing. That writing does not require registration. I have said this on a number of occasions. Now, this AR 1968 was a case where the party had relied upon an unregistered partition deed. It was not a memorandum of an earlier partition. The document indicated that under that very document, a division had taken place. Therefore, it was inadmissible in evidence to prove a partition. Then the question was, all right, under the Hindu law, or there can be an oral partition also. Why not oral evidence to show that there is a partition? Parties have separated themselves, they are cultivating the land separately, they are living separately and all that. Supreme Court said, this written document is inadmissible in evidence for want of registration. That oral evidence is inadmissible in your section 92. So, what practically what happens in a suit for partition, appearing for the defendant, if you have an unregistered document under which division has taken place, practically you have no defense at all. You can't let in oral evidence because it is prohibited by Section 92. You can't uh, rely upon that document. Ah, well, whether there is collateral purpose and all that, that could be collateral to our present today's discussion. I don't want to go into it. There, you see, such uh, situations should be there. and. Uh, I think the more or less on the same lines uh, following this, we have uh, AR 1988 Supreme Court, page 881. AR 1988 Supreme Court, page 881, Roshan Singh versus Zail Singh. I am not referring to any other decision under the Registration Act or Stamp Act or regarding the visibility of documents, uh, because that is not the subject for today's discussion. But since we are discussing about section 92 of the evidence that I thought that this decision may be of some help to It's a kind of refreshing the memory of those who have already heard me on this platform, a source of new information to those who are hearing me for the first time. Then there is section 100. Nothing contained in this chapter shall be taken to affect any of the provisions of the Indian Succession Act as to the construction of wills. I am not dealing with it because it requires uh, a good lot of preparation on my side and uh, 
it requires a separate session which i don't propose to do i am only drawing your attention to those particular provisions in the indian succession act which you also need to keep in you nothing contained in this chapter shall be taken to affect any of the provisions of the indian succession act as to the construction of wills now chapter 6 of the indian succession act i am sorry uh, this indian succession act uh, has different parts totally it has 11 parts in each part separate chapter numbers are given so what i am referring to is chapter 6 in chapter 6 in part 6 of the indian succession testamentary succession part 6 chapter 6 the title is of the construction of wills sections 74 to 149 some of these sections you find some words found in these sections almost similar to the words used in this 93 to 99 i'm honestly telling you i have not prepared myself to speak on this and i don't do it also it requires some preparation on my part also to speak to them and please don't ask me any question with regard to them because i am not come prepared for that i am only trying to tell you you need to read those provisions also because section 100 says nothing contained in this chapter shall be taken to affect any of the provisions of the indian succession act as to the construction of wills which are those sections which deal with the construction of wills interpretation of those wills is contained in section 74 to 149 now this oral evidence which is prohibited by this documentary evidence it is called the rule of parole evidence there are two words with the same pronunciation but with slightly different spelling p a r o l parole parole evidence is in the context of this section 92 another parole in the context of criminal cases accused is in confinement i mean uh, is in custody for some reason he is allowed to go out of the jail for some time that is letting him in on parole for a temp- parole that is a temporary that is there the spelling is p a r o l e in the context of the section 92 it is p a r o l parole evidence something like oral evidence now uh you get uh, some indication of this in law of evidence by sarkar this is edited by mc sarkar and sc sarkar and pc sarkar because i have found the sarkar is a very common name there are few other authors by the same name sarkar uh, because i have seen some other book uh, what is stated in the book by sarkar with me is something totally different there the book i have is one edited by mc sarkar sc sarkar and pc sarkar it is 16th edition it is 16th edition of course uh, one other person is sudeep to sarkar uh, there, there are other things now in this edition which i said 16th edition volume 1 there it is stated the rule in section 91 it deals with the exclusiveness of documentary evidence and that in section 92 relating to its conclusiveness are often loosely referred to as parole evidence in stephen's digest they are dealt with under one head in the evidence that they are treated as separate rules and since neither the excluding principles nor the exceptions to the rules are quite identical this seems the preferable course the distinction between etc in fact uh, in this book on my hand my hand the there is a tabular column 
explaining the difference between section 91 and 92 it is also stated there uh, so this parole evidence is something or evidence when it is private now let me refer to a two decisions in this context Nineteen seventy nine, volume four, SCC page sixty six zero. Nineteen seventy nine, volume four, SCC page sixty six zero. Krishna Bai is a long name. I give only the first page there. Krishna Bai versus Appa Sahib. Appa Sahib. This is one decision. Which uh, tells us in detail the scope of sections 91 and 92 of the Evidence Act. We are unable to accept the Desai's argument that the process adopted by us would involve contravention of section 92 of the Evidence Act. Some argument was advanced before the Supreme Court. If this is the way this document is construed, then we would be violating section 92. We would be varying or contradicting the terms of a written document. The Supreme Court did not agree. This is what the Supreme Court said. Firstly, in this process, which is essentially one of construction of the deed exhibit thirty nine, no question of contradicting, varying, adding to, or subtracting any term of the disposition is involved. The deed exhibit thirty nine falls into two distinct parts. The first of them comprises the preamble or the preliminary recital of a past fact. Preliminary recital of a past fact, something that happened. This part does not contain any term or disposition of the property. Such terms are confined only to the second part. Section 92 prohibits only the varying of the terms of the documents, not the memoranda or recitals of facts bereft of dispositive terms. Particularly when the correctness of the whole or any part of the recital is in question, we are primarily concerned with this preliminary recital, which does not fall under the dispositive or operative portion of the document. The question is whether or not this recital of a past oral intimation by Ramachandra Rao to Nara and Rao had caused a severance of joint family status. It is settled law. That a clear intimation by a co-partner to the other co-partner of his intention to sever the joint status need not be in writing. Need not be in writing. Uh, some time back, some honourable judge of the Karnataka High Court was telling jokingly, on the dining table when you are dining with your uh, uh, children and other things, if one of the sons says, "From tomorrow, I am not taking food in this house," then there is that severance in status. So that he does not, he is not required to communicate in writing. It is settled law that a clear intimation by a co-partner to the other co-partner of his intention to sever the joint status did not be in writing. For these two-fold reasons, the bar in section 92 against the admissibility of extrinsic evidence for the purpose of showing that the insertion of the words for your maintenance in the recital is wrong, unread, unmeaning, and the coinage of the executor's own brain is not attractive. Secondly, there is ample authority for the proposition. That when there is a dispute in regard to the true character of a writing, that's what I have been telling. Evidence dehars the document can be led to show that the writing was not the real nature of the transaction, but was only an illusory, fictitious, and colourable device which clothed something else, and that the apparent state of affairs was not the real state of affairs. So what appears from the document is not the real transaction. It does not depict the real affairs. Something else was in the contemplation of the parties. That is why we have seen this is only a sham document. It is only a nominal document. It was never acted upon. No title has passed out to the other side under this document. Then we have 1982, one SCC page four. 1982, one SCC page four. Ganda Bai versus Chabu Bai. Ganda Bai versus Chabu Bai. 1982, Volume One, SCC, Page Four. Page 
The next contention on behalf of the appellant is that subsection 1 of section 92 of the evidence that bars the respondent from contending that there was no say and it is submitted that the respondent should not have been permitted to lead parole evidence, that is oral evidence, in support of the contention. That's what I said. In a suit for specific performance, the defendant contends it is only a security for the loan advanced and really not an agreement of sale, though it is styled as an agreement of sale. There is a sale deed. I have said about an uh, agreement of sale. There is a sale deed. It is open to the other side to say it was not intended to be a sale transaction. It was intended to be a loan transaction. Section 91 of the Evidence Act provides that when the terms of a contract or of a grant or of any other disposition of property have been reduced to the form of a document, and in all cases in which the matter is required, of course, it is a reproduction of the section. Now I will come to what the Supreme Court has said. It is clear to us, it is clear to us that the bar imposed by subsection 1 of section 92 applies only when a party seeks to rely upon the document embodied in the terms of the transaction. embodied in the terms of the transaction. In that event, the law declares that the nature and intent of the transaction must be gathered from the terms of the document itself and no evidence of any oral agreement or statement can be admitted as between the parties to such document for the purpose of contradicting or modifying its terms. The subsection is not attracted when the case of a party is that the transaction retarded in the document was never intended to be acted upon at all between the parties and that the document is a sham document. Such a question arises when the party asserts that there is a different transaction altogether and what is regarded in the document was intended to be of no consequence whatever. For that purpose, oral evidence is admissible to show that the document executed was never intended to operate as an agreement, but that some other agreement altogether not retarded in the document was entered into between the parties. Some decision of the Privy Council is also cited. The trial court was right in permitting the respondent to lead parole evidence in support of her plea that the sale deed dated so and so was a sham document and never intended to be acted upon. It is not disputed that if the parole evidence is admissible, the finding of the court below in fair the respondent must be proved. The second contention on behalf of the other is Then we have 1998 7 SCC 498. 1998 7 SCC 498. Vishnu Devo Narayan Rai. Vishnu Devo Narayan Rai versus Anmal Devi. Anmal Devi. Uh, some provisions of the DP Act and all that have been referred to. It follows, it follows that on execution and registration of a sale deed, the ownership, title and all interests in the property pass to the purchaser unless a different intention is either expressly or necessarily implied, which has to be proved by the party asserting that the title has not passed on registration of the sale deed. Such intention can be gathered by intrinsic evidence namely from the other governments in the sale deed itself or by other attending circumstances subject of course to the provisions of section 92 the evidence in the normal course when there is a registered document title passes there are but it would be open to the parties to show that we had intended that the sale that the title should pass on at a subsequent point of time then 1999 2 SCC 583, 1999, 2 SCC 583, Hindu public and another, Hindu public and another versus Rajdhani Puja Samiti, Rajdhani Puja Samiti, 1999, 2 SCC 583. Uh, some contention was heard with regard to 91 and 92. In our view, this is not correct in law. Oral evidence could be adduced to show that the recitals in a deed were nominal and were not intended to be acted upon or that they were not meant to alter the existing state of facts. 
then 2000 volume 1 scc 434 2000 volume 1 scc 434 ishwar das jai ishwar das jai versus sohan lal ishwar das jai versus sohan lal Well, apart from uh, section 34 of the Evidence Act, this also deals with uh, section 92 of the Evidence Act. The plea of the defendants. Uh, this court has held in Gangubai versus Chabubai, that is the decision which I gave 1982 one Supreme Court patent. It is permissible for a party to a deed to contend that the deed was not intended to be acted upon. But as only a sham document. The bar arises only when the document is relied upon and its terms are sought to be varied and contradicted. In the above case, it was observed by Justice V. A. Desai as follows. Uh, then, 2003, 2003, Volume 6, SCC 595, 2003, Volume 6, SCC 595. So I have referred to some passage from Kipson's Evidence Act, Whitmore Evidence Act. It has been described by, by Whitmore stating that the rule is in no sense a rule of evidence but a rule of substantive law. It does not exclude certain data because they are for one or other reason untrustworthy or undesirable means of evidencing some fact to be proved. It does not concern a probative mental process. Uh, then, section 91 and 92 apply only when the document and the face of it contains or appears to contain all the terms of the contract. 91 is concerned solely with the mode of proof of a document, the limitation imposed by 9 with limitation imposed by 92 relates only to the parties to the document. If after the document has been produced to prove its terms under 91, provisions of 92 come into operation for the purpose of excluding evidence of any oral agreement or statement for the purpose of contradicting, varying, etc. Section 91 would be inoperative without the aid of 92. And similarly, 92 would be inoperative without the aid of Section 91. The two sections, however, differ in some material particulars. 91 applies to all documents whether they purport to dispose of rights or not, whereas 92 applies to documents which can be described as dispositive. 91 applies to documents which are both bilateral and unilateral. Unlike 92, the application of which is confined only to bilateral documents. Both these provisions are based on best evidence rule. The law will not couple and mingle matters of speciality which is of the higher authority with the matter of government which is of inferior account in law. There are some English judges. It would be inconvenient that matters in writing made by the grounds of exclusion of extrinsic evidence are to admit inferior evidence when the law requires superior would amount to nullify the law. And when parties have deliberately put their agreement into writing, it is conclusively presumed between themselves and their privies that they intended the writing to form a full and final settlement of their intentions and one which should be placed beyond the reach of future controversy, bad faith and preference to bring. So the basic rule is no oral evidence to contradict. Exceptions I have told you they are contained. The next decision is 2004, volume 4 SCC, page 794. 2004, volume 4 SCC, 794, Parvinder Singh versus Renu Gautam. 2004, Volume 4, SCC 794, Parveendar Singh versus Renu Gautam. The rule as to exclusion of oral by documentary evidence governs the parties to the deed in writing. A stranger to the document is not bound by the terms of the document and is therefore not excluded from demonstrating the untrue or collusive nature of the document. A executes some document in favor of B in respect of a property belonging to C. Yeah, can the court say, no, no, there's a written document, you see, you cannot contend that you are the owner. No. The rule as to exclusion governs the parties to the deed in writing. A stranger to the document is not bound by the terms of the document 
and is therefore not excluded from demonstrating the untrue or collusive nature of the document or the fraudulent or illegal purpose for which it was brought into being. An inquiry into reality of the transaction is not excluded merely by availability of writing recited in the transaction. Uh, some decision is cited is an authority that the that Privy Council decision I said is an authority for the proposition that oral evidence in departure from the terms of a written deed is admissible to show that what is mentioned in the deed was not the real transaction between the parties but it was something different. Then 2009 4SCC 193 2009 4SCC 193 Kaliya Perumal versus Rajagopa, 2009, 4SCC 193, Kaliya Perumal versus Rajagopa. We have heard the learned counsel for the parties at length and consider the evidence oral and documentary forming part of the data. The question posed for our consideration is whether title to the disputed properties passed to the appellant when the sale date dated 26-6-1983 was registered on 26-10-1983, though admittedly no amount was paid towards consideration to the respondents. So whether the title passed on when admittedly no consideration was paid was the question. Then sale is defined as being a transfer of ownership for a price. In a sale, there is an absolute transfer of all rights in the property is sold. No rights are left in the transfer of. The price is fixed by the contract antecedent to the conveyance. Price is the essence of a contract of sale. There is only one mode of transfer by sale in regard to immobile property the value of rupees 100 or more and that is by registered instrument. It is now well settled that payment of entire price is not a condition precedent for completion of the sale by passing of title as section 54 of the transfer of property act defines sale as a transfer of ownership in exchange for a price paid or promised or part paid or part exchange for a price paid or promised. The sale consideration is not paid on the date the document is executed. See the Purchaser promises to pay the sale consideration on a subsequent date. It is if the intention of the parties was that title should pass on execution and registration, title would pass to the purchaser even if the sale price or part thereof is not paid. In the event of non-payment of price or balance price as the case may be, the remedy of the vendor is only to sue for the balance price. He cannot avoid the sale. He is however entitled to charge upon the property. Then. Normally, ownership and title to the property will pass to the purchaser and registration of the sale deed with effect from the date of execution of the sale deed. But this is not an invariable rule as the true test of passing of property is the intention of parties. Though registration is prima facie proof of an intention to transfer the property, it is not proof of operative transfer if payment of consideration or price is a condition precedent for passing of the property. The answer to the question whether the parties intended that transfer of the ownership should be merely by execution and registration of the deed or whether they intended the transfer of the property to take place only after receipt of the entire consideration would depend on the intention of the parties. Such intention is primarily to be gathered and determined from the recitals of the sale deed. When the recitals are insufficient or ambiguous, the surrounding circumstances and conduct of the parties can be looked into for ascertaining the intention subject to the limitations placed by section 19. The last decision in the series is 2011, 6 SCC 555. 2011, 6 SCC 555, Janath Gulari Devi, J A N A K, Janath Gulari Devi versus Kapil Devo Rai. Janet Dulari Devi versus Kapil Devo Rai, 2011 6 SCC 555, a judgment by Honorable Justice R.V. Ravindran. Uh, on these contentions, on the contentions urged, the following questions arise for consideration in this appeal. Question number one 
whether the appellants had paid rupees 17,000 towards sale price to the second respondent. Question number two. Whether title to the property passed to the appellants on execution of the sale deed. Third. Whether the second respondent vendor was justified in cancelling or repudiating the sale on the ground that the sale consideration was not paid. Four. Whether the appellants are entitled to the relief claimed in the suit. On the first question, whether the appellant had paid rupees 17,000. Uh, the finding of the fact recorded by the first appellate court that the appellants had not established the payment of rupees 17,000 after consideration of the entire evidence affirmed by the High Court in the second appeal does not call for interference in an appeal under Article 130. It is a finding of fact. Therefore, the Supreme Court said that the finding of the trial court and the appellate court, that is the High Court, that the appellant had not established that the entire sale price was paid to the second respondent was accepted. Regarding the other questions, whether the title to the property passed to the appellants on execution of the sale deed, there this question has been referred to. The earlier decision that I have referred to has been stated, a few more decisions, and the legal provision is reiterated in this case. Now, uh, this is the large and short of the scope of sections 91 to 100 of the Evidence Act. As I said, we will have to start from section 59 of the Evidence Act, which says the contents of a document can be proved only by the production of the document and proof of the document, which is the best evidence rule is incorporated in it. So 91 says, when the parties intend a transaction or a contract to be in writing, that writing alone needs to be produced, or when the law requires that a transaction or a contract should be in writing, there should be that writing. 92 says that when that writing is produced and proved in a manner provided by section 67 to 72 of the evidence, eh? oral evidence to contradict vary the terms of the contract or grant is impermissible, subject to the exceptions found in provisos A to uh, provisos 1 to 6, and 93 to 99 are also in the nature of provisos. 100 of the evidence that says that the provisions of the Indian Succession Act regarding construction of bills are not affected by the evidence that. Yes, any questions? Yes, sir. I will be taking from the YouTube. This is by Ravi Pandey. Whether confessional statements huh. in writing before the I.O. Hmm. of some other case by uh, can be made admissible in the case of another case if the accused person making confession is common in both the cases. It is uh, totally outside the scope of today's subject. Okay. As you have heard me, I have spoken more in respect of civil cases because uh, application of sections 91 to 100, they arise in court when we deal with a civil case. Will you please repeat the question anyway he has asked if I can answer it without further uh, Investigation, I will answer it. I don't want to uh, say that I don't want to answer, even if it yeah. is not within the subject discussed. If I, I don't understand. Go if I not the further mind, to please uh, repeat the question. Uh, whether the confessional statement in a writing before the I.O. in su some other case be made can be made admissible in the trial of another case if the accused person is making a confession is okay. common in both the cases. First of all, the question is, confession before a police is totally prohibited by law. Whether it is in this case or some other case, it has absolutely no evidentiary value. Accused may be common. Now, probably the question is in this context. If I have understood, what practically happens is this. A person is apprehended by the police in relation to a particular crime. He makes a confessional statement. Let us take a theft case. He says, I went to the house of Mr. X, broke open the lock, entered in, ransacked the house, and stole something. Next day, I went to the house of B. Now, the police have apprehended him or arrested him in the case pertaining to the theft said to have taken place in the house of A. A particular case is registered, a number is given. Now, in the process, he also makes 
a statement, a confessional statement relating to some other crime or theft committed by him. Investigation goes on those lines. But ultimately, this confessional statement is produced in the main case or in some other case, whatever it is. Certainly, it is the same accused. Whatever said and done, it is a confession made to the police. 24, 25 and 26 of the evidence are very clear. Confession obtained by a promise or by inducement is no confession. 25, confession made to a police is no confession. 26, confession in the custody of a police is no confession. 27 is an exception. Is that confession leads to discovery of a fact. Only so much portion of the confessional statement which leads to that discovery alone is relevant and admissible in evidence. Therefore, my answer to his question, which in my opinion does not require further investigation on my part, is this. Now, whether it is the same case or some other case, whether it is the same accused or some other accused, the question of uh, the, its admissibility in evidence would not arise because it's a confession made to a police. It would be admissible in evidence, provided that any portion of that confessional statement has led to discovery of a fact under section 27. 27 starts with the word provided. Normally, there will be no independent section starting with the word provided. It will be always a proviso to the main section. But in the evidence that there are two sections which start with the beginning with the words provided. One is this 27 and another is 108. 107 says if a person is not heard of for a period of uh, uh, seven years, is I mean 107 says if a person is known for 30 years, the person who says that he is dead has to prove that he is dead. 108 says provided if a person is not heard of for a period of seven years by those who would naturally have heard of him then the presumption is that he is dead. 27 is also a section which starts with the word provided. It says, provided that if any fact is deposed to, as discovered in consequence of the information furnished by a person accused of an offence in the custody of a police officer, so much of such information, whether or not it is confessional, as leads distinctly to the fact thereby discovered may be proved. Only that portion of that confessional statement which leads to discovery of a fact. If I remember correctly, the first occasion on which I spoke on your platform was with regard to this uh, statement under section 27, 164 and 161, confessions and other things. That was the first occasion somewhere in 2020 when the, COVID, uh, when the COVID started. The COVID started. Uh, now, the, the leading case on the point is that the Privy Council decision, that is uh, Kulukuri Kottaya versus Emperor, 1947 Privy, Privy Council. Youngsters will do well to read that statement. Now, uh, what is important is many youngsters are of the impression that the 27 statement is only for the recovery of some weapons, recovery of stolen articles. No, it is discovery of a fact. A fact which was not known to the investigating officer prior to this accused disclosing it. From the accused, he discovers that fact. Now, let us take a murder case. And he, the accused commits murder of a person, shifts the dead body to some other land. He doesn't keep the dead body in the place where he actually killed that man. He carries the dead body and puts it somewhere. The owner of the clan sees some dead body lying there. He lodges a complaint to the police saying that I am seeing a dead body. There are some chalk marks and other things. I think somebody has killed him. He is not an eyewitness to the incident. He does not know who the accused is. So he only says I am seeing a dead body. Some person appears to have been killed. Based on that investigation starts. Now the, some person is apprehended. He says well, I, if taken, I will point out the place where the incident took place and I will also point out the place where this uh, dead body was lying. Now, where actually the incident took place was not known to the police till the accused gave that. So, it is discovery of the fact of the place where the incident took place. 
to that extent it will be as visible in evidence it is discovery of a fact but often times what is discovered is some dead body thrown there some weapon of weapons some stolen article pledged with a pawn broker yes any other question yes any other question yes sir uh, just as he says though not directly related let's assume some witness <coughs> denies that he doesn't want to come for a cross examination uh-huh. then what is the scope then adverse inference has to be drawn there is no question of uh, uh, saying that, that uh, uh, evidence of the witness who has been examined in chief is discarded and all that the point is he does not tender himself for cross examination you keep that evidence ultimately while appreciating the evidence you will say whether uh, uh, he not tendering himself for cross examination has any effect in the case supposing he has in the chief examination he has only spoken about certain documents which are not in dispute why that exclusion why that evidence should be discarded so if there is a serious dispute about what he has stated in the chief examination not subjecting himself for cross examination will definitely foresee the court to draw adverse inference there is some bad practice of discarding the evidence or expunging the evidence at that time itself there is no question of expunging discarding the evidence it would be there at the time of judgment the court has to consider what is the effect of he not sub- subjecting himself for cross examination if it is a case where cross examination is absolutely necessary now let us say he speaks about two documents the execution of which is not in dispute at all he speaks only about two documents let us say a witness is an attesting witness to some document he says in my presence the document was attested all right he does not tender himself for cross examination if the execution of the document is not in dispute at all whether he has subjected himself to cross examination or not is of no consequence but if there is something else other than that attestation or execution about which he has spoken which is denied then certainly to that extent he not tendering himself for cross examination will have an effect there is no question of discarding or expunging his evidence at that stage well enough opportunity is given he has not tendered himself for cross examination the court should make a note of it that's all in the proceeding sheet or in the order sheet and proceed with the trial yes next question yes sir Dr. Jaisema, he says, can adoption deed be proved by oral evidence? Can a document be proved by oral evidence? Adoption, adoption deed. Adoption deed can be proved by oral evidence. Now, the point is this. Adoption as such does not require a deed. Now, if there is a deed, if both the person giving the child in adoption and taking the child in adoption have signed that document and that document is registered then there is a presumption under section 16 of the hindu adoptions and maintenance act to be effect that the adoption is in a, is in compliance with the provisions of this act in fact decision say the section does not presume that in fact an adoption took place it only presumes that the formalities required by the adoption act have been complied with if there is a registered instrument neither the registration act nor the hindu adoptions and maintenance act requires an adoption to be in writing but what does 91 say if something is reduced into writing though law does not require it to be in writing oral evidence is impermissible oral evidence is impermissible so adoption is something for which law is not uh, law does not require it to be in writing parties have chosen to put it in writing but the next question is is it a contract or a disposition it is neither a contract nor a disposition it is neither a contract nor a disposition to me it appears despite uh, uh, there were uh, there be over evidence may be admissible to prove that adoption took place because i don't think that there may be adoption deed which seems to the disposition of a contract or a disposition for pulling section 92 maybe i had not anticipated this question there was no occasion for me to examine from the 
way in which section 91 is uh, uh, couched <coughs> this is my first impression well if there are some decisions to be contrary to what i have said well i will with all humility accept it. well second question it takes it forward he says if a cld doesn't mention the price of all can the same be proved by way of oral evidence yes yes it could be it could be it could be this is by main drain he says can the plaintiff reopen recall or present the deferred ia as po has written for the arguments in order sheet and what provisions i did not follow the question so question number 2 out of the main drain he has posted three questions hmm. what is that question second question what is that so second question out of those three questions which has uh, mendran has posted in the chat box yes what is that question can the plaintiff reopen recall or represent the deferred ia as po has written for arguments in order sheet and under what provisions deferred okay he has written the deferred ia as po has written for arguments in order sheet can you uh, reopen that evidence question number 2 what is his name so mendre huh? mendre mendre let me see ha ah, can the plaintiff reopen recall or represent the deferred ia as po has written for arguments in order sheet well hey. there is no specific provision here now one application was filed some interim application was filed the deferred ia has written for arguments what provision reopen or recall or represent the deferred ia no it was mentioned as argument some it was not taken up well he can bring to the notice orally or by way of an application to 151 cpc saying that this application has pending you had deferred consideration for that yeah. probably what he means is for arguments means perhaps he means for arguments on the main matter he can bring to the notice of the court by some mistake it is posted for arguments on the main matter An order, an an order on the CIA is required for this purpose. Maybe even the other side has no objection. Even a oral submission may be sufficient. Or if the other side is absent, or he still insists on something being there in writing, an application under one fifty one CPC should be sufficient. And again, it depends on at what stage the matter was, why that application was filed. Suppose if it is an application for temporary injunction. now the case is ripe for arguments on main matters why should the court reopen the matter to only to hear the application for temporary injunction supposing it was an application for amendment of the complaint or for implementment of a party well there is some point in reopening the matter and hearing that internal article in the last question we will be taking now this is by sujata in a plain paper written as rupees 6 lakhs so, uh, one minute this man has one more question can the court start argument stage without reopening the disposal the same thing question number 2 and question number 3 they are related uh, and then that's right they are yeah. intermingled all right next who is the next man that's uh, sujata ha uh. sujata so, shrikor says in a plain paper written as rupees 6 lakhs taken for his father's personal need hmm. is it admissible in evidence what does it mean in a plain paper it mean means thereby No, that the acknowledgement of some amount has not been registered. Uh, there is no uh, agreement. This is a thing related to stamp act. Now the point is, what is the content of that document? I mean the transaction, which is written on plain paper. First of all, the spelling is wrong. It is P L E. It should be P L E I N. Anyway, she has written it. It is plain. It doesn't matter. It should be a plain paper. What she means is that something is written on a paper. which is not duly stamped a plain paper written as rupees 6 slash taken for his father's personal need now the point is what is the nature of the document is it a promissory note for which some stamp duty is required under the indian stamp act is it a money bond for which some stamp duty is payable under the local stamp act it depends on what actually the document is so it depends if it is the document is not sufficiently stamped In view of Section 35 of the Indian Stamp Act, corresponding to 34 of our Act, maybe some other state has some other provision. It becomes admissible in evidence only on payment of duty and penalty. In the state of Karnataka, it is 10 times the deficit duty. 
maybe the position elsewhere also is the same because 35 the Indian stamp pact also to my knowledge says same. And tax the penalty. Yes, it is the next question. Uh, one is simplicity it says, can we say that section 93 is patent and rest of the section 94 to 100 is are latent? Let me see. 93, when the language used in a document is in its face ambiguous or defective, the evidence may, be, it may not be given on the facts. Certainly, it is a case where it is a patent ambiguity. 94, the language used in a document is plain in itself and when it applies accurately to existing facts, evidence may not be given to show that it was meant to apply to such facts. It is also patent. 95, when language used in a document is plain in itself but is unmeaning in reference to existing facts, it is a latent ambiguity. 96, when facts are said that the language used might have been meant to apply to anyone and could not have been meant to apply to more than one, this again is latent. 97, when the language used applies partly to one set of existing facts and partly to another set of existing facts, but the whole of it does not apply correctly to either. The evidence will be given to show to which of the two parts. Certainly, it is related. 98, evidence will be given to show the meaning of illegible or not commonly intelligible characters. So, it could be both uh, illegibility, well, if something is illegible, it may be patently eligible or latently. If totally it, is, it cannot be read, it is patently eligible. If a part of it could be read, <laughs> all right, uh, these are things. Uh, is only serve the examination purpose. Practically, they are of no use. Then, yes, next. Also, thank you. And we would also like to thank Koshik and his wife. Yes. For, uh, we can keep them blocked for the entire audience from Pan India and abroad for sharing your knowledge. And it's only because of them. Uh, so, we acknowledge on behalf of Beyond Law CLC and all those viewers who are watching right now and subsequently also for their contribution towards this knowledge sharing process. And thank you, sir. We are always indebted. Thank you. As I have been always saying, you have taken me beyond Karnataka. Thank you. No. You have taken me beyond Karnataka. No, it's it's a pan India. A pan India, and in fact, abroad also. A lot of people watch it from Pakistan, Bangladesh, US, etc. Also, keeping in view the topic itself. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night.